for the introduction and also for the invitation to speak. It's very nice of you to host this online seminar series and I'm really grateful to be part of it. <clears throat> so today I'll talk about the, the Bernstein problem. And the reason I chose this topic is because I think that this problem was the motivation for some of the most important developments in uh, nonlinear elliptic PDEs and in geometric analysis for the past century. So to begin with, I just want to recall what the basic problem is. So around 1915, Bernstein proved the following uh, beautiful and surprising theorem. He says the following, that if you have, let's say, a smooth function on R2, all of R2, and it solves this nonlinear elliptic equation, the minimal surface equation, divergent, say, written in divergence form, <coughs> divergence of gradient over square root of 1 plus gradient squared is equal to 0, then the function has to be a linear function. Okay. So what this equation says is that the graph of u is a minimal surface in R3. So the sum of the principal curvatures is zero at every point. And it says something kind of surprising. Basically, if you have a minimal surface in R3 and it has non-zero curvature at some point, then when you write it as a graph over the tangent plane at that point, eventually that graph has to become vertical. Otherwise, it would be a global solution to the minimal surface equation and have to be flat. And uh, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I find this surprising is that the minimal surface equation to me is somehow uh, the geometric version of the Laplace equation in the sense that if you write this nonlinear equation over the tangent planes to the graph of u, then at the contact point with the tangent plane, it reduces to the Laplace equation. So this is like Laplace's equation, but invariant under rotations of the graph. On the other hand, we know that there are many, many examples of nonlinear global solutions to the Laplace equation. For example, you could take the real part of any holomorphic function, e to the e to the e to the z, and have really fast growth. <clears throat> so this is a situation where the nonlinearity of the equation really helps you get rigidity. And uh, the so-called Bernstein problem asks whether the same result holds when you replace R2 by Rn, so whether it holds in all dimensions, not just two dimensions. Now, this problem is completely solved, but I'd like to spend a short time just discussing some of the key ideas in its resolution, because uh, they're important for the rest to talk, but also beautiful in their own right. So <clears throat> first, Bernstein's original proof in two dimensions is uh, highly non-trivial and it involves say two parts a topological argument that doesn't involve the minimal surface equation at all and then a special observation about minimal surfaces in r3 so the, <clears throat> the proof is split into several parts the first is uh, an idea that's ubiquitous in the study of the 2d elliptic pdes and it's just a basic observation which is that if you have a saddle-shaped function in R2, so determinant d squared w is less than zero, that means that uh, w is saddle-shaped at every point, then the tangent planes to the graph split it into at least four, uh, split it into, yeah, at least four connected components that go off to infinity. And uh, the reason that they go off to infinity is simple. You could think, for example, in this picture, if the blue lines are the nodal set of w, then if they met up somewhere, then w would have to have an interior maximum. And at that point, it couldn't be a saddle shape. And using this topological observation, Bernstein showed that any solution to an elliptic PDE in two dimensions doesn't have to be uniformly elliptic. So AIJ, WIJ is equal to zero on R2. That satisfies the growth condition. For example, it's bounded, <coughs> has to be a constant. So in fact, he showed that any solution to an elliptic equation in non-divergence form in two dimensions, which has sublinear growth, is a constant. And I call this a corollary in quotes because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a consequence of the topological observation, but it's not at all obvious how to prove it from the topological observation. It's a little challenging. And in fact, I think his original proof had some uh, 
small flaws that were eventually resolved. So, so far in the argument, uh, the minimal surface equation hasn't appeared at all, but Bernstein brings the minimal surface equation into the picture by noticing that this funny function inverse tangent of a directional derivative of a solution to the minimal surface equation is harmonic on the graph of u. So it solves some elliptic equation uh, when you view it as a function on R2 and it's bounded. So the previous result applies to it. And I'm not sure exactly how Bernstein cooked up this uh, special function, but it's closely related to the, uh, the observation that if you have a minimal surface in three dimensions, then the Gauss map is a conformal map into the sphere. And this is because the Gauss map takes a point on the surface to the unit normal, and the derivative of the unit normal is the second fundamental form, which has to have eigenvalues which are uh, of equal size, an opposite sign. Okay, this is, a, I think, quite a, a challenging proof. And in the subsequent years, people found different proofs of Bernstein's result, but they were all very two-dimensional. They relied somehow on the complex analysis ideas, like related to the conformality of the Gauss map of a minimal surface in R3. And it wasn't until 1962 that Fleming came up with a new proof uh, that really had a hope of generalizing to higher dimensions. And his idea was based on something completely different, which is the observation that a minimal surface in any dimension and co-dimension uh, has a, let's say, looks dilation invariant at either very small or very large scales. And that's the content of the monotonicity formula. So using this monotonicity formula, he says that if you have a, a global solution to the minimal surface equation, a global minimal graph, <clears throat> and you zoom out and zoom out and zoom out, then this graph, uh, say some subsequence of these zoom outs, converges to a non-flat area minimizing hypercone in Rn plus one. So he reduced the problem to deciding whether or not there exist these area minimizing cones in Rn plus one. Okay, and so for example, if you're working in uh, R3, so solutions over R2 to the minimal surface equation, then uh, there would have to be uh, an area minimizing cone or a minimal cone in R3, but intuitively these should not be possible uh, because in R3, there's just two curvatures that you're dealing with, and one of them is zero automatically because of the cone structure of K. So if one of them is zero, the other one is forced to be zero. And so the cone would have to be flat intuitively. Okay. And after Bern or Fleming's uh, proof, people really jumped on the problem. And in a matter of, it uh, looks like seven years to completely resolve the Bernstein problem. So in 1965, DeGiorgi made a small improvement of Fleming's result. And he showed that the cone K has a special structure, a cylindrical structure. So what it looks like is an area minimizing cone in Rn uh, cross R. So every slice, every horizontal slice is a copy of this area minimizing cone C in Rn. And so he gained one dimension compared to what Fleming could do. And then <clears throat> uh, in dimensions four and then up to seven, Umgren and then Simons, prove that area minimizing cones uh, have to be flat. And in fact, they didn't need the full information that the cone is area minimizing. All they needed was that uh, any cone which is minimizing under tiny perturbations, so small perturbations increase the area, uh, have to be flat in low dimensions. And this used the stability inequality. And then finally, uh, in 1969, Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti constructed nonlinear global solutions to the minimal surface equation, uh, which say in dimension eight has cubic growth, so nonlinear global solutions. And uh, that shows that the result of Simons is sharp. And so this completely resolved the problem. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about this example later, but I'd like to relate a short story I, I read recently 
that Bombieri de Giorgi and Giusti solved this problem in three days. So apparently they, they got together and just worked on it nonstop for three days straight until they cracked it. And uh, that was it. So I guess there was a real sense of urgency to solve the problem. Uh, it's kind of an amazing story. Okay. So anyhow, uh, to complete the discussion of the Bernstein problem, it, uh, see, once you have these counterexamples in high dimensions, it's natural to ask if you can impose some additional hypotheses so that the Bernstein result still holds. And there are some natural growth conditions that one can impose. So for example, if the gradient of the solution is globally bounded, then the solution has to be a linear function. And uh, the reason basically is that the, uh, the equation becomes uniformly elliptic in that case. And so the Harnack inequality of de Georgi and Nash can be applied. And then <clears throat> uh, this can be further relaxed. So if you sort of integrate this inequality, uh, you assume something weaker that U just has linear growth then it has to be a linear function. And the reason is that basically linear growth implies the global gradient estimate. And that's by an interior estimate of Bombieri de Giorgi and Miranda from 1969, which is uh, an extremely important advance in its own right. It was in fact used in many contexts, uh, also by Bombieri de Giorgi and Giusti to construct their counter example. And finally, the best result I know to date is that if the gradient of the solution grows a little bit slower than linearly, then uh, the solution has to be linear. And this is a theorem of Ecker and Huysken from 1990. <clears throat> and this result is basically sharp. If you look at the, the analogs of the Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti example in very high dimensions, You'll notice that the gradients grow something like big O of x to the power one plus one over dimension. So as dimension gets very large, this estimate gets better and better. And finally, some of uh, my favorite open problems related to the Bernstein theorem, which are, uh, I think, quite challenging, are the following. First, all the examples we have of nonlinear global solutions to the minimal surface equation they grow polynomially at infinity. In fact, I think cubic might even be the, the fastest growth we have. So a natural question is, do all entire solutions of the minimal surface equation necessarily grow polynomially? And uh, this seems like a pretty tough question. One might hope to attack it by trying to use the information about the tangent cone of the solution at infinity, but this is, uh, this is difficult because we don't have information in general about the uniqueness of this tangent cone. And these uniqueness of tangent cone questions are uh, a real headache. And uh, <clears throat> the second problem, which I really like, is does there exist a nonlinear polynomial that solves the minimal surface equation, maybe in some very high dimension, like a billion? And this question has a more say, algebraic nature to it. It's more related to uh, algebraic geometry and representation theory. So I, I don't know how to solve these problems. So uh, I won't pursue that any further, but I will say move a slightly different direction now. And the direction is motivated by the question, um, is the minimal surface equation maybe part of a family of equations uh, for which this Bernstein theorem holds. So can it be viewed as a family of more, say a natural family of a general class of nonlinear elliptic equations for which a Bernstein theorem uh, is true? And the answer is in a sense, yes. And there's a very natural candidate for nonlinear elliptic equations, a general family of elliptic equations to which the minimal surface equation belongs. And these come from studying the so-called parametric elliptic functionals. So the objects of interest now will be again hypersurfaces in Rn plus one, but instead of asking that they minimize the area functional, we'll ask them minimize something a little bit different. So it's the in sort of a weighted area functional, this integral of the area element, but weighed by a function which depends on the direction of the unit normal to the surface. So now if we have a, 
a minimizer of a functional like this, then rotating it uh, won't keep the problem invariant. So we lose rotation invariance for these functionals. <clears throat> and what we assume about this weight or this integrand phi is that it's a one homogeneous function on Rn plus one. It's uh, a norm, so it's say positive and smooth on the sphere, and it's convex. So the level sets of phi are uh, nice, smooth, uniformly convex sets. And uh, this is what we mean when we say that this is an elliptic function. So for example, you could think that if phi is one on the sphere, then we recover the area function. And <clears throat> the reason that this is regarded as a uniform ellipticity, in my opinion, is easiest to see when you look at the equation that the critical points of the functional satisfy. So if you take uh, the first variation of this functional, you see that a minimizer satisfies the following equation. Let's say the second derivatives of phi, take the trace of that with the second fundamental form at the surface, and this is zero. And this basically is saying that the principal curvatures are balanced. This is like a weighted sum of the principal curvatures of the surface is zero. So for example, if phi was the area case, phi of x equals mod x, then this would be the identity matrix, and the Euler-Lagrange equation would be the sum of the principal curvatures is equal to zero, the mean curvature equal to zero. And in the general case, the eigenvalues of this matrix are between positive constants. So it's sort of like a geometric version of uniform ellipticity. And the phi Bernstein problem uh, asks exactly the same thing that we ask in the Bernstein problem for minimal surfaces. So if a minimizer of a phi can be written as the graph of a function over all of Rn, then is this hypersurface necessarily a hyperplane? Okay. So let me just take a short moment to connect this problem to uh, an elliptic equation. I'm not completely comfortable with uh, to the geometric version. I'm more of a PDE person. So uh, for the, the PDE people, the way we can rewrite this problem is if we have this hypersurface sigma written as the graph of a function u, then this geometric version of the equation, phi sub ij, 2ij is equal to zero, can be written in terms of the function u as this quasi-linear elliptic equation, little phi sub ij at gradient u times uij sum over i and j is equal to zero, where this little phi is just the integrand capital phi, but restricted to the hyperplane tangent to the sphere at the North Pole. So this little phi is uh, asymptotically one homogeneous. So this quasi-linear elliptic equation is degenerate elliptic. The ellipticity degenerates as the gradient gets very large. And it degenerates in the same way, the same fashion as it does for the minimal surface equation. Okay, and I think that the easiest way to see this is just to rewrite the functional in terms of u. So you have to write the integral of phi dA, and you plug in the formula for the unit normal in terms of the function u, and the area element in terms of u, and then you apply the one homogeneity of the integrand phi, then you just get this integral of little phi at gradient u, dx. And so this quasi-linear elliptic equation is just the euler lagrange equation associated to this last function. Okay. So now let me briefly review what's known about the Bernstein problem for these parametric elliptic functionals. First, in two dimensions, there's the positive result. That global solutions to these equations of minimal surface type are linear functions. And this was proved by Jenkins in 1961. And again, the proof is based on complex analysis. So it's based on the fact that the unit normal to the graph in three dimensions is a quasi-conformal map into the sphere. Okay, so uh, that's the, the two-dimensional result. Again, a lot of times in elliptic PDEs, when I see a theorem is true in two dimensions, I don't necessarily have a lot of hope that it generalizes to higher dimensions, especially if the proof is based on topology or uh, special energy estimates. <clears throat> 
But surprisingly, Leon Simon managed to extend this result to three dimensions. And the reason I say surprisingly is that the key, uh, say, the key fact that we needed to extend the Bernstein theorem to higher dimensions was the monotonicity formula. And this is something that we lose for these parametric elliptic functionals. But nonetheless, the Bernstein theorem in three dimensions for these parametric elliptic functionals is true. And unsurprisingly, the result is much more sophisticated, say the proof is much more sophisticated. Simon relied on a very deep regularity theorem due to Almgren, Shane, and Simon around the same time for uh, minimizers of the parametric problem. And finally, in higher dimensions, Simon also showed that if the functional is sufficiently close to the area functional, then the Bernstein theorem holds up to the same dimension as for minimal surfaces, dimension seven. And if growth hypotheses are imposed, then the Bernstein theorem holds in any dimension. So for example, if the gradient of a solution is bounded globally, or if the solution has linear growth. And the ideas uh, of these theorems are the same as before. Uh, the proofs are still challenging and a bit technical. Okay, so what this leaves open then is so what happens in dimensions between four and seven. So the Bernstein theorem holds in three dimensions and this at first makes me think, uh, okay, if you have a theorem in 3D for solutions of elliptic equations, now it makes me think maybe there's something um, about these parametric elliptic functionals that uh, makes this magic number seven appear. Maybe it's not just the monotonicity formula. Maybe there's something a little bit uh, different. And the main result I want to discuss today uh, takes a step towards answering this, this question. The main result is this, is that uh, indeed one can construct nonlinear global solutions to these equations of minimal surface type in dimensions smaller than eight. There, there exists a quadratic polynomial in six dimensions and the graph of this polynomial in R7 minimizes a parametric elliptic function. So there is something special about the isotropy of the area functional that makes this dimension seven or eight uh, the, the magical one. And when you relax this isotropy, you can build these examples in lower dimensions. And a few comments about it before I go on is first this integrand is necessarily far from one on the sphere, because if it was very close to one, then uh, the global solutions would have to be linear by that theorem of Leon-Simon. And in fact, as we'll see, the level sets of this integrand phi are somewhat box-shaped. And uh, <clears throat> the second point I'd like to make is that the quadratic polynomial that works in six dimensions has a very natural analog in four dimensions, and that happens not to work. So the, uh, the Bernstein problem for these parametric elliptic functionals remains open in dimensions four and five. But I do have a strong opinion about what's supposed to happen in these two dimensions, dimension four specifically, and I'll uh, get to that near the end of the talk. Okay, so for the remainder of the talk, I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit about what goes into the proof of this theorem. And I think a natural starting point is to recall the approach of Bambieri de Giorgi Giusti in uh, say for minimal graphs in dimension eight. So let me briefly recall that. So for minimal graphs, phi of x is equal to mod x, and in R8, which will split into two pieces, R4 cross R4, uh, the starting point of Bambieri de Giorgi Giusti is of course to look for an area minimizing hypercone. One of these has to exist in order for there to exist a nonlinear global solution to the minimal surface equation. And the most natural candidate is the so-called Simon's cone, mod x is equal to mod y. So I think it's easier just to work with the picture to explain what they did. So the Simon's cone C, mod x equals mod y is a good candidate because it's symmetric. It looks the same from both sides. And so it has mean curvature zero. It's a critical point of the area functional. And the first step 
for them was to show that the C is not only a critical point, but a minimizer of the area functional. And they did this by showing that there exists uh, a smooth perturbation of the Simons cone, which I call sigma, which is a minimal hypersurface and is asymptotic to the cone near infinity. And it lies on one side of the cone, which is very important. And this required a careful ODE analysis. So this sigma, so sigma is uh, invariant under the same, has the same symmetries as the Simons cone. So it's variant under rotations in X and Y. And the point is that the dilations of the surface sigma then foliate one side of the Simons cone. And as a general principle, anytime you have a foliation of some space by critical points of a functional, then each of the leaves in the foliation is a minimizer of the functional. And so this showed that the Simons cone is in fact area minimizing. And something quantitative I want to point out is that uh, there's a very specific rate of convergence of this approximation to the Simons cone by a minimal surface. And it, the, the way that, that I like to view it is that if you move a distance r out along the cone from the origin, then the surface is roughly a distance r to the minus two from the cone. And this power minus two is related to the geometry of the cone. So it comes from studying the Jacobi operator of the cone. But the point is that if you want to construct a global solution to the minimal surface equation in R8, I think their idea roughly was that the level sets are supposed to look like the leaves of the foliation. So we could imagine if we look for a function whose zero level set is the Simons cone, and whose one level set is this hypersurface sigma, then it goes from zero to one in a distance capital R to the minus two. So that means that the gradient should grow quadratically and this function should grow something cubically. And so they noticed that this hypersurface sigma is in fact uh, resembles the one level set of this cubic homogeneous function, distance from origin cubed times cosine of two theta, where tangent theta is mod y over mod x. This is sort of like polar coordinates. And finally, what they observed is that this function uh, it's a short computation to show that this function is in fact a subsolution to the minimal surface equation where it's positive and a super solution where it's negative. And the hard part in their paper is to show that there's a perturbation of this function, which has the same growth, cubic growth, but is a super solution where it's positive and a subsolution where it's negative. And this is a very tricky bit of computation. But then uh, once they're equipped with these super and sub solutions, they could apply the maximum principle. They could solve the Dirichlet problem in larger and larger balls, solve the minimal surface equation, and then take a limit to get a solution that has cubic growth. Okay. So just a, a short comment before we go on. A natural question is what happens if you try their approach in lower dimensions? So if we're working RK cross RK, where K is three or smaller, then the approximate minimal surfaces to the corresponding Simon's cone start to oscillate around the cone at infinity, so they cross it. And the point is that the dilations of these approximating surfaces are no longer foliations, they intersect one another. And uh, indeed, as we know, these cones, uh, they're not minimizing. Okay, but now, <clears throat> Let me move on to the uh, idea of the construction in R6, which is philosophically completely different. And the reason is that we have the freedom in choosing the integrand phi. So the approach is to fix a natural candidate for a global solution to a minimal surface type equation, fix u, and then build the integrand phi. And this is going to be, it turns out, uh, a hyperbolic problem. So forget everything you've learned about elliptic equations for the time being, and we'll start uh, thinking about wave type equations now. And let me explain the connection a little bit more clearly. So the Euler-Lagrange equation, remember, is this quasi-linear equation, phi i j at gradient u times u i j is equal to zero, where little phi is the integral capital phi restricted to a hyperplane. And the trick is to rewrite this equation 
uh, in terms of the Legendre transform of you. So if you're not familiar with Legendre transform, uh, don't worry too much. Basically, the Legendre transform is defined in the gradient space of U. So we can change this problem into a linear one. And the Hessian of the Legendre transform is the inverse of the Hessian of U. So this quasi-linear elliptic equation for U is now viewed as a linear hyperbolic equation for phi. And the reason it's hyperbolic is that any good candidate for a solution to a minimal surface type equation will be saddle shaped. So this matrix will have positive signature. <clears throat> and so philosophically, what we're doing is we're solving the Cauchy problem for this hyperbolic equation. And every time we do that, we solve for some function phi, we get a solution to this uh, quasi-linear equation. And uh, somehow what we're doing, as the way I like to view it, is we have this crystal surface or something given by the graph of U, and we send waves through it. We're building every possible functional functional that this crystal surface could minimize. And what we're doing is we're just praying that one of them satisfies the right convexity condition. So that's the hard part. We have to choose uh, a solution phi that satisfies all the right convexity conditions. Okay. So to get a little bit more specific into how this is accomplished, uh, say inspired by the approach of Bambieri de Giorgi Giusti loosely, let's work in R2K where we split it into two pieces, RK cross RK. And we'll choose U to have the same symmetries as the Simon's cone in our 2K, but we'll choose it to be very simple, just the quadratic mod X squared minus mod Y squared. And we'll also choose little phi to have uh, the same symmetries as the, the Simon's cone in our 2K, so invariant under rotations in, mod, in X and Y. And when we do this, the equation becomes basically the wave equation in two dimensions with a lower order term. So the equation becomes the wave operator on the function psi plus this lower order term where the dimension appears as the coefficient. Let's say grad psi dot one over s minus one over t. And uh, here s is mod x and t is mod y. So when I see this at first I get pretty hopeful because this is a very classical hyperbolic equation in two dimensions, and it's pretty well studied. And in fact, there are representation formulae for solutions in terms of various hypergeometric functions. The problem is that uh, understanding the convexity properties of the solution seems like a, a, a big challenge when you work with these hypergeometric functions. I'm not too familiar with them, but something happens, something very special happens, it turns out when k is equal to three, a miracle happens. So when k is equal to three, so when we work in R6, the equation reduces basically to the wave equation. You have the wave operator on S t times psi is equal to zero. And so there's a very explicit representation formula for the solution. It's just a sum of uh, traveling waves of speed one in opposite directions. That's D'Alembert's formula and divided by S times T. And so at this point, the game is to choose the functions little f and little g, the shapes of these traveling waves, so that when you track back and reconstruct this integrand capital phi, it satisfies all the right convexity conditions. And I'm not gonna say uh, too much into what goes into this choice, that's the really tricky part of the problem, but I will say this, that we want this function little psi to be asymptotically one homogeneous. And that means that it's very natural to choose little f and little g to be asymptotically three homogeneous because the denominator is a two homogeneous polynomial. So when you divide the two, you get something that looks uh, one homogeneous. And it turns out that one choice of capital phi that works is this expression here. So it's some uh, function in the numerator that's homogeneous of degree three divided by uh, homogeneous of degree two function. So the specific form I don't want to get uh, too much into is not so important. I do just want to emphasize that it has a fairly simple expression. Uh, something I do want to emphasize though is the geometry of this integrand phi. So if you look at the level sets of this integrand phi, uh, so here I've drawn the one level set 
in the X7 is equal to zero hyperplane, then the level set looks sort of like a deformed sphere. And it's, uh, it's sort of box shaped. So you have to go further out along the direction of the, thi of the Simons cone to reach the one level set than in the coordinate directions. And from a variational point of view, this is actually very natural. And the reason is that if you look at the quadratic u, x squared minus y squared, then overwhelmingly its unit normals point in the direction of the Simons cone. And so whatever integrand we take, we want it to grow more slowly in those directions than in the coordinate directions. And so that explains from an energetic perspective why this is uh, somewhat natural. Okay. So to say, finish up the discussion, I have just a few remarks and I want to get into what's supposed to happen, especially in these open dimensions four and five. The first remark is that this phi that I wrote down is just some very special example. Uh, this algebraically simple. There are many possible choices of capital Phi that one can get, for, for example, by perturbing the shapes of the waves, uh, little f and little g. So that's one remark. Uh, the second remark, which is uh, more important, is that the level sets of the function u, this quadratic, uh, happen to all these level sets minimize the same parametric elliptic functional. And this elliptic functional has the integrand phi zero, where phi zero is the phi that we constructed, but restricted to the x7 equals zero hyperplane. And this uh, just comes from the homogeneity view. So the fact that u is too homogeneous, plus the fact that solutions to the equation it solves are invariant under uh, Lipschitz rescalings means that all the multiples of u are also solutions. So if you look at multiples of u and if you slide them up and down, then you can basically take uh, any level set of u and by taking multiples and sliding up and down, you can converge to the cylinder over the level set. And this shows that all the level sets minimize this elliptic function. And the reason I want to bring this up is that it's closely connected to the problems that appear when you try the same polynomial, but in four dimensions, or k is equal to two. So for the same reason, the one level set of this quadratic polynomial R4 would have to minimize some parametric elliptic functional, but it turns out that it doesn't. So using just some ODE analysis, you can prove that the one level set of this quadratic polynomial doesn't minimize any uniformly elliptic functional uh, in four dimensions. However, uh, Frank Morgan showed around 1990 that the analog of the Simons cone in R4, so, modic, so the zero level set of U, does minimize a parametric elliptic functional. <clears throat> and he proved this by the technique of calibrations. So the level sets of the function U, this, is, this would be like a, a foliation proof of minimality. Morgan used a different proof where you cook up a special divergence-free vector field, which satisfies some special inequalities. This is the calibration technique. And so there is, say, hope for an approach in 4D to this Bernstein theorem for parametric elliptic functionals, which sort of is motivated by Morgan's theorem and inspired by the uh, Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti approach and by the approach in six dimensions. And let me just finish with that. So as, a, as an approach to the case n is equal to four, uh, this is joint work with my uh, PhD student Yang. <clears throat> we are first trying to find a new proof of Frank Morgan's theorem by foliation. And it looks like you can foliate the sides of the Simons cone in R4 by hypersurfaces that minimize uniformly elliptic functionals, but they look like level sets of functions which are homogeneous of degrees smaller than two, not equal to two. So what this suggests then is that we fix functions which are asymptotically homogeneous of some degree less than two, and then we play the hyperbolic game. We try to solve some hyperbolic equation, choose a solution which gives rise to an integrand with correct uh, convexity properties. Okay, and uh, 
Finally, one last remark, it looks like this foliation can be done with hypersurfaces that look like level sets of functions that are homogeneous of any degree larger than one, which is kind of interesting. So what that suggests is that one can possibly build solutions to equations of this type, which have barely faster than linear growth. And one could try to, uh, uh, to ask for the, the opposite direction as well. So if you will instead fix an integrand, but ask that the gradient grows sufficiently slowly, so it grows like big O of x to the epsilon rather than being bounded, then is the solution necessarily linear? So this positive result looks like it would be a very close companion to these constructions which grow barely slower than linear, which it seems hopeful exist. And <clears throat> Uh, one last remark is that in all these previous constructions, the integrand that we managed to build was C21 on the sphere, but not smooth. And it, natural questions are, can we make these integrands smooth or in fact real analytic? I really think this should be possible. The C21 regularity seems more just like a technical thing for convenience. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and to invite any questions.